I think we're still having some folks join us and uh, we'll go ahead and get started to make sure that we're on target for our schedule. Um, today, we're gonna start with an opportunity to hear from the candidates for Texas Agricultural Commission. Um, having, I don't think the word endured uh, Sid Miller, the former rodeo clown is Agricultural Commission for the last several years. Uh, what's really refreshing is the opportunity to hear from people that are not just engaged and able to do the job, but are able to do the job without turning into a reality show. Um, and once we have an opportunity to visit and hear from them and about what's going on in their race and what Texans who are interested in agriculture, which kind of includes everybody who eats, uh, ought to be able to, to, to understand We'll have a, a great panel on labor issues from across the country to visit with us. And as always, we'll lay, save the last 10 to 15 minutes for questions. And if you already have questions thought out or you're thinking of them as a go, please put them in the chat function so that we can make sure they're answered fully. Thank you very much for being here. I'll also give you kind of a heads up. We're already started the planning for June. Fingers crossed, it'll be live again at Zaza. Hopefully it won't be a a pause in the pandemic like it was last year. It'll hopefully be on the, the coastal part that we'll be together. Uh, and as last year, we expect a stellar lineup of speakers and the opportunity to visit and uh, share time with all y'all is something that we're going to make a lot of effort to make sure it works as well as it has in the past to turn into the, the marquee event for the Democratic lawyers. Uh, at this point, I want to go ahead and, and turn it over to Ed Ireson, who's uh, originally from the Houston area, Fort Bend County, uh, and is, is one of the candidates that are in the next six weeks, I guess, or a little less than that. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to uh, make your decision for Democratic candidate. Thank you, Ed, for joining us. Howdy, y'all. Uh, my name is Ed Ireson, and I am running for the Commissioner of Agriculture. Uh, I'm a businessman, a new father, uh, and a proud Texan. Uh, as was mentioned, I was born in Houston, uh, but my family's been uh, raising cattle up in Brazos County for over 130 years now. Uh, I'm running for the next generation of Texans. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what the Department of Agriculture actually does. Uh, first, it oversees school meal programs. Uh, I think we need our kids to have a healthy, well-rounded well meal uh, so they can be ready and focused to learn. Uh, you know, if you're hungry, it's, it's hard to focus on your education. Uh, next up is rural infrastructure development. Uh, that's things like healthcare and internet. Uh, I think it's critical that we have equitable internet access, uh, no matter where you live across the state. Uh, our rural communities are being left behind um, without internet access. And our kids need to be able to come home from school and, and do their homework, uh, do research, take a test, apply for college, all those things, uh, you know, the internet is, is critical to have. Uh, finally, the job is really about promoting Texas agriculture. Uh, I want our kids to know that, that there's a massive opportunity that lies within the, within the in industry. Uh, it's a huge part of the Texas economy, uh, and our kids should know that they can get a good job in, in ag and uh, not have to move to the big city just to make a living. Uh, come November, uh, I think the voters are going to be looking for something different. Uh, I think they want somebody who's going to come in and, and work to serve all Texans uh, with integrity, honesty, uh, and transparency. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you all for taking the time. Uh, my name is Ed Ireson, for Texas Ag Commissioner, and my website's edfortexas.com. Thank you, Ed. And by the way, you know your sign in the background is, is not quite the right way, is it? Was that on purpose? <laughs> it is on purpose. Okay. It's art, they say. Sorry. I, okay, gotcha. <laughs> Got it. Got it. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I should have told you that before we went on. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you for, for that. Uh, Susan, thank you. And please tell us a little bit about uh, what your thoughts are on this uh, important race for Texans, school kids, and the rest of us. All right. I'm Susan Hayes. I grew up in Brownwood. I'm a lawyer of practice law in Dallas, Austin, and I'm now pretty much living in Alpine, where my husband and I are cultivating both hemp and hops in a little high mountain eco uh, microclimate. I got to know the Ag Commission you know, way too closely working on the hemp program. I helped draft and pass the bill that legalized hemp in Texas and all the things that led to the commissioner's consultant being indicted, I got to watch pretty up close and it was pretty enraging. So that's why I decided to run. I, once I'm elected ag commissioner, first step is clean that place up, go to bat for the budget at the Capitol. The budget has been cut down to the core because even the Republicans don't trust Sid Miller. Second, rural health care. That, that agency has a rural hospital and economic development program. They're rotting in the basement. 
And third, law in the long-term goal, sustainable ag. That is a climate change issue. It's also, and when I say sustainable, I mean both environmentally and economic. We need to make it possible for more Texans to cultivate and possible for a wider variety of diverse products in Texas. Right now, over 70% of our products are cattle, cotton, or chicken. Uh, we need more fruits and vegetables. I look forward to visiting with any of y'all in the future, and I'll drop my contact information in the chat. Boy, thank y'all. And y'all are right on target on time, so that's much appreciated as well. Uh, Steve has already put on the chat the uh, um, their, both their websites, so for more information about their campaigns, to support them, to ask questions, it's already in there, and I hope you'll at least consider uh, spreading the word about what the Democratic Party and the candidates, both of them, have to offer for the agricultural commissioner position, which for too long has been kind of a laughing stock of the state in so many ways. So today, um, and it's really Steve Dubel who, who made reminded me of how important the labor, well, we all know how important the labor movement is to the workers, to the folks that actually make things, build things, create things in our, in our community. I come from a union labor family. My grandfather was a union organizer. So this is obviously something that's very near and dear to my heart. But what's really promising today is the opportunity to not just hear about the struggles that we're facing now, not just hear about the steps that are going to happen, but we have a program that will actually give us the opportunity to understand, you know, battles that have been won, things that have been in the past, because as bad as we think it was, when I hear the stories about what my grandfather faced in the 20s and 30s, it wasn't just people that were mad at him. It wasn't just uh, people that were resisting. It was people that were shooting at him. Uh, so we've come a long way. We have opportunities to build on what's really critical, not just to the foundation of the Democratic Party, but more directly to the health and welfare of our community. Um, Jay Malone, who's going to be more or less coordinating a very well put together program today, originally from Ohio, is a Houstonian by choice, um, fortunately married to a native Houstonian. Uh, Sprechen Sie Deutsch, da? Is that true, Jay? There we go. Uh, so thank you, and we look forward to hearing what you're going to share with us. Thank you, Jay. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to open up our slideshow. Hopefully everyone can see it now. Um, so I uh, wanted to thank Steve uh, for putting this together. Uh, thanks, Mike, and, and everyone who joined us today. Um, my name is Jay Malone. I'm the political director for the Texas Gulf Coast Area Labor Federation. Um, we are a federation of 92 local unions with jurisdiction in 13 Houston area counties. Um, in total, our union affiliates represent over 60,000 members in a wide variety of industries, uh, federal, state, and local government, education, transportation, entertainment, service and hospitality, building and construction, um, a total of 92 unions. Um, so my background is in education. I went to graduate school in Germany and taught at colleges in the Cologne area for six years. Um, my focus was on the political system in the former Soviet Union, not on American labor law, but I've always been interested in understanding the structural reasons for why societies function the way that they do. Um, so that's what we're going to be talking about. Why um, is it uh, in many ways challenging for workers to advocate for themselves and what protections do they have in the law? So presenters today will be uh, Yana Rosen um, and Alberto Aguirre from uh, the AFL-CAO, uh, both are coming to us from DC. Um, and uh, both, with, both have uh, extensive experience in Texas. Uh, Yona uh, practiced in Dallas uh, for a long time and Alberto is a native of El Paso. Uh, John Lowe, the Secretary Treasurer of IATSE Local 51, which represents stagehands uh, in the Houston area. Uh, Linda Morales, our Organizing Director of the Texas Gulf Coast Area Labor Federation. And so this is, these are the areas that we'll each be covering. I'll start off here with background on labor law and history of labor law in our country. Uh, Yona and Alberto will be going next to talk about uh, labor law today. Uh, and then finally, John and, and Linda will give some practical examples of their experiences organizing the challenges uh, that they often face. So um, to start us off, um, I am going to be discussing some major pieces of federal and state legislation uh, that together form the framework of modern labor law, uh, as well as the concept of at-will legislation. Um, this is not intended to be comprehensive by any means. Um, this is just a jumping off point uh, so that we can have a discussion, an informed discussion 
of the current state of labor law, um, which again will be covered in more depth by my colleagues from the AFL-CIO. Um, and so that we can understand the framework that organizers are operating under um, and the constraints that they're operating under within the uh, current law. So uh, the first place that I wanted to start off with was the Railway Labor Act, uh, which was enacted in 1924. Um, and uh, American workers have always acted collectively in the workplace to advocate for themselves and their co-workers, but legal protections for these activities are relatively modern. Um, our Brief history is beginning with uh, the first piece of, one of the first pieces of legislation um, that uh, created the modern framework of labor management relations for the vast majority of workers. Um, <clears throat> the importantly, um, so the, the Federal uh, Railway Labor Act um, was the first federal law guaranteeing the right of workers to organize and join unions and elect representatives without employer coercion or interference. Uh, the IRL, RLA applies to freight and commuter railroads and airlines and was explicitly passed, this is in the statute, to avoid work stoppages that threaten to substantially interrupt interstate commerce to a degree such as to deprive any section of the country essential transportation services. So important things that the RLA created were mechanisms to resolve uh, disputes through collective bargaining uh, as well and, and through the National Mediation Board. So there's multiple ways that the, the law uh, establishes for, for disputes to be resolved. Um, the NMB, the National Mediation Board, also conducts uh, union representation elections uh, for workers in, um, in airlines and in the airline and uh, rail industries. Um, the RLA, and this will be discussed further later, also creates a standard of major and minor disputes that have made it increasingly difficult for rail and airline employees to strike. Um, last week, for example, a judge issued an injunction blocking 17,000 employees of BNSF from striking um, after finding their dispute was minor, and that's an ongoing uh, dispute uh, between uh, the unions representing uh, the workers, uh, rail workers, and, and the company. So um, the RLA was an important first step in establishing protections for collective bargaining and action, collective action by workers. Um, and it was followed up by several additional pieces of, of legislation that expanded those rights uh, to other private sector workers. The most important was uh, the National Industrial Recovery Act, which was signed by President Roosevelt in 1933 um, and protected collective bargaining for private sector workers. Um, 1935, this law was overturned by the Supreme Court. And in response, Congress passed uh, the Wagner Act in 1935. Um, which is also called the National Labor Relations Act, uh, which restored the legal right of most private sector workers to join labor unions and bargain collectively with their employers. It also prohibited employers from engaging in unfair labor practices, uh, which was not included, importantly, in the Ray Railway uh, Labor Act. Um, importantly, though, it did exclude um, some su substantial uh, numbers of workers, um, including farm workers and domestic workers who are not protected uh, or included in the National Labor Relations Act, um, and therefore have much more limited rights, uh, much of which are currently granted by states on a kind of a piecemeal basis. Um, so in the following decade after the Wagner Act was passed, um, union membership skyrocketed from 3.7 million in 1935, which was about 10% of the labor force, to over 15 million, uh, which was over a third of the labor force in 1945. Um, so the NLRA makes clear that the policy of the United States is to encourage collective bargaining by protecting workers' full freedom of association. The NLRA provides employees at private sector workplaces the right to seek better working conditions and designation of representation. Um, it also creates a legal, legal framework. Um, so it creates a legal framework for these protections, but does not include strong enforcement mechanisms, which again, my colleagues will be discussing uh, in, in a later section uh, of how the National Labor Relations Board, which is created by the act, actually functions and what can be done uh, when um, the law is violated. So uh, public employees are not covered by the NLRA um, and are governed by separate entities at the state, entities and statutes at the state and federal level. Um, in 1978, Congress passed the Civil Service Reform Act, for example, which created the Federal Labor Relations Authority um, and the FLRA governs labor relations between the federal government and its employees. Um, and then again, there's a patchwork of state laws for state and municipal employees in Texas, for example. Um, most public employees do not have the right 
uh, to collectively bargain uh, with the exception of some firefighters and police um, and, and EMS workers. So the passage of the Wagner Act uh, created a, coincided with a massive increase in organizing across the industries of millions of workers forming unions across the country by the end of the decade. And this created a backlash. So uh, this is where we're gonna talk about right to work, which was the, the cornerstone of that backlash. And I'm gonna start off introducing this with a quote from Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. who I think uh, explains this much better than I can. Um, so quote, in the glorious fight for civil rights, we must guard against being fooled by false slogans such as quote unquote, right to work. Uh, it is a law to rob us of our civil rights and job rights. Its purpose is to destroy labor unions and the freedom of collective bargaining by which unions have improved wages and working conditions for everyone. Wherever these laws have been passed, wages are lower, job opportunities are fewer, and there are no civil rights. Um, and Dr. King said that in 1964. Um, so the reason why he said this is because the concept of right to work was developed by Texan Vance Muse, who saw it as a critical tool in undermining the increasing strength of multi-ethnic labor unions, which he saw as a threat to the Jim Crow regime governing the state at the time. And the laws, which the, our, our law currently stands in Texas and um, in, in many other US states, do not outlaw unions or collective actions by employees, which are protected by the National Labor Relations Act and other federal laws, but rather encourages free riders in unionized workplaces. So this means all union members pay dues to support the efforts of the union to collectively bargain, negotiate grievances, and advocate on behalf of all workers, free riders, receive all these benefits, but do not have to pay dues. Um, and right to work was codified by the Taft-Hartley Act or Labor Management Relations Act in 1947, which passed over the veto of President Harry Truman. Um, among other things, this legislation allowed states to pass their own right to work laws that allowed all employees to be involved in collective bargaining or receive union legal representation without paying union dues or any fees. Um, the Taft-Hartley Act rolled back protections on three major fronts. Um, as part of the early McCarthyist um, you know, mania, the law required union officers uh, to submit anti-communist affidavits. Um, it tipped the scales um, uh, in labor disputes by dispensing with the expectation of management neutrality and prohibiting a range of unfair labor practices, including jurisdictional strikes, uh, secondary boycotts, um, and wildcat strikes, and it opened the door for individual states, as we just mentioned, to, uh, to pass right to work laws. Um, so to end, I'm just gonna talk really quick uh, because my time is up uh, and I wanna get to the rest of our presentation. Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about outwill employment. Um, although 28 states currently have anti-union right to work laws in place, employment relationships are presumed to be at will in all US states except Montana. Um, and even in Montana, that has been recently challenged. Um, so at will uh, means that an employer can terminate an employee at any time for any reason, except an illegal one, or for no reason without incurring legal liability. Um, so the reason why we bring this up is because there's often a confusion around at will, the concept of at will and right to work. Um, many people think that right to work means that um, you know employees can be fired for any reason. Um, another re another thing that people mistake is thinking that right to work means that unions are illegal. Um, but at will is something that basically all employees have to deal with unless they have a contract. So collectively bargained union contracts nearly always define cause for termination, along with many other provisions protecting the rights of employees beyond the basic legal rights provided to them by federal and state law. This is another reason why protecting the right to organize, protecting the right of unions to join together in union um, is so important. So um, I'm now going to uh, pass this over to my colleagues at the AFL-CAO. Uh, we'll be starting with uh, Yona Rosen, Associate General Counsel of the AFL-CAO. Thank you, Jay. Um, and we, I'm gonna give you, it's going to be very short, very fast uh, introduction to labor law, but uh, Federal labor law, as Jay mentioned, really is the, the statutes are the NLRA, the RLA, and the FLRA. And we're gonna be focusing primarily on the NLRA. We're gonna talk about what it's like now and what people's rights are now, and then talk about um, the, the sort of lack of effectiveness and the problems with NLRA 
and the fact that um, there has been a move in the PRO Act, which has been passed by the House, uh, but not yet by the Senate, to address some of those issues and concerns. So if we can go to the next slide, and I'm going to go through some of this pretty quickly. Um, so the NLRA, as, which is what I'm going to primarily be focusing on, um, it covers only private employees, but not private employees who are agricultural workers, railway workers, airline employees. Um, it also, the rights that it gives and the way it defines employee is someone who is not a supervisor and not managerial. So these rights that we're talking about only go to employees who are non-supervisory and there's a test for whether you're a supervisor or not a supervisor and also um, who are uh, not managerial employees. The, the key rights that employees get under the National Labor Relations Act are the right to join together with or without a union, but to join more than one employee, to join together to address wages, hours, and working conditions, either by being represented by a bargaining representative or through protected concerted activity or to refrain from any of that if, if the employee so chooses. Um, the two things that the NLRA does and the, the whole purpose of the NLRB is to uh, run elections to determine if employees in a particular group want to be represented by a union, and then also makes certain conduct, unfair labor practices, originally, as Jay pointed out, under the Wagner Act, unfair labor practices by employers, but there's a separate set of unfair labor practices that could be committed by unions. And the NLRB processes those kinds of unfair labor practice charges. Next slide. So um, the important differences in between the, what the sort of structure that is set up by the NLRA and the structure that's set up under the RLA is in terms of organizing, it's in, in many respects, it's easier to organize under the NLRA than it is under the RLA because the RLA requires that if you're going to organize, it has to be to a wall-to-wall -wall unit, which means like, for example, when the Delta flight attendants wanted to organize, you have to organize all the Delta facilities, uh, all of the flight attendants who, who work for Delta across the country. So even if there is strong support um, among a certain group, you're not going to be successful unless you can organize the entire country. Um, whereas, you know, if you look at the uh, Starbucks elections that are going on now across the country, it's being done store by store by store. So if you have support in one store, you can have an appropriate unit because under the National Labor Relations Act, it just has to be an appropriate unit, not a single unit that is defined as it is in the RLA that it has to be wall to wall. Um, and then under, uh, there are certain prohibitions in the RLA that mirror <clears throat> the prohibitions in the NLRA, but there's no internal administrative process for bringing those kinds of charges. You actually have to address those claims in a lawsuit. And then as Jay mentioned, you have the issue with the major and minor disputes. And if it's a minor dispute, you can't strike with respect to that. And you have to go through uh, basically an arbitration-like procedure that's what the system board system um, and not go directly to court. Okay, next slide. So the National Labor Relations Board structure is you have a five-person board that actually decides ultimately the cases, um, but the cases, and this would be cases that are brought under uh, as an unfair labor practice charge that would and there are a number of regional offices at down to i think 26 originally there were 32 but each uh, there's a regional office in fort worth that covers most of texas and then one um phoenix office has a, a small sub office in el paso that covers some of uh west texas but you have the five person board that actually are ultimate deciders, but you also have a general counsel who acts in sort of a prosecutorial type role. And so when somebody brings a union or an employer or an employee brings a charge of an unfair labor practice, it would be investigated by that a particular regional office uh, that is has responsibility for that geographic area. 
and the regional director who is the head of that office would decide based on a um, neutral investigation whether there appears to be a violation. If there appears to be a violation, then they issue a complaint and it's tried before an administrative law judge with then the general, the lawyers who are working for the general counsel essentially acting like essentially prosecutors uh, to support the, the agency's interest in enforcing the law. Um, as I said, Texas is mostly covered by region 16, although West Texas is covered by region 28. And if you want information, the, the NLRB website, which I cite here, is very, very helpful in terms of general information and answering a lot of questions and also just a lot of um, easily accessible information about the cases that are being processed. Next slide. Um, so the election process. So as I said, there are two different things that the board offices do. One is to process petitions for an election to determine if employees in a particular unit want to be represented by a particular union. And once the petition is filed, there would be a determination as to whether the requested unit is an appropriate unit. It doesn't have to be the most appropriate unit, but it just has to be appropriate in terms of there being a community of interest among the employees in that unit. And there has to be certain 30% uh, uh, support demonstrated that 30% uh, 30, 30 of the employees are asking for an election. Um, and then there are certain things that would preclude an election. For example, if there's a contract already in place, you can, it can block an election for three years, up to three years, depending on the term of the contract. Um, sometimes elections are held uh, by agreement. And sometimes if the parties, if the employer and the union can't agree to all of these issues, then it would be a hearing, pre-election hearing, and then a decision by the regional director as to what, whether or not there will be an election. And if there is an election, who it's gonna cover and how it's gonna be conducted. Um, so elections can usually, uh, oftentimes in, prior life before COVID, it was in person, although occasionally with mail ballots, but um, and sometimes mixed uh, in person and mail ballots. Right now during COVID, they have been entirely mail ballot elections. And then there are, it, the elections are supposed to be conducted in uh, laboratory conditions. And so um, sometimes there might be objections as there was in uh, as there were in the amazon the first amazon election in bessemer and that election was overturned and there's now based on objectionable conduct and now there's going to be a second election in bessemer next slide so, sorry um so but I, one of the things i really wanted to focus on i want to talk about what's sort of uh the key probably the key right that the National Labor Relations Act provides to employees is that they have the right, to the sections was referred to as section seven rights, which are employees shall have the right to self-organization, to form, join, or assist labor organizations. So that's the part of being able to form a union, um, to bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing. So that's this part that supports collective bargaining and to engage in other concerted activities for the purpose of collective bargaining or other mutual aid or protection. And this is key because this, people don't always know this, but um, it's not just that employees have a right to be represented by a union. Employees have a right to get together and talk about their wages, hours, and working conditions. So for example, it's so prevalent that there be rules you know, keeping your, your salary or your pay rate secret, those are unlawful under the National Labor Relations Act because employees have a right to talk to each other, to join together as, as few as two, uh, to do something to address their concerns about their wages, hours, and working conditions. And so this is the key right that all the other aspects of the National Labor Relations Act go to support. Now the problems, and I think one of the things that I, uh, next slide, one of the things that I wanted to be sure to talk about with you is that this has turned out to be in many respects, kind of a weak and not very effective uh, law. 
for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons is, um, as Jay indicated, he talked about the level of union organization back in 1945. Um, but in recent times, most recently, um, there has been a there has been a very strong uptake in the popular support for unions in the public um, public questionnaires. People say they believe in unions, they, they would like to be in a union, but the number of people who are actually represented by unions is in has been in decline over the last um, number, large number of years, probably since really since uh, the 80s. Um, and part of that is because of how difficult it is to organize how stacked against organization the uh, the law is another reason is how difficult it is to reach a first contract so even when you successfully organize a, a, a bargaining unit getting to the first contract can be very hard and because the national labor relations act essentially doesn't have very much in the way of teeth so um the problem, and this is, uh, Alberto is going to talk about this a little more, but one of the problems is that um, the, you have these rights, but a not very effective way of enforcing them. And the, the remedies when there is an unfair labor practice, generally it is in terms of, you know, don't do this. So you can get a posting of a notice saying, don't do this. Um, and then a make whole remedy in terms of putting the person back, re, uh, making the person whole, putting them back to where they would have been if the law had not been violated. So for example, when somebody is terminated for, um, for having engaged in union activity or having tried to organize a union, the remedy would be put them back to work and pay them their back pay offset by anything that they've earned in the interim. So there's really not a high, high price for an employer to pay when they have violated the law. Um, and so one of the things that the PRO Act, which I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes does, is to try to address that. Um, and the other thing that I, so, so the unfair, so those are the things that make it kind of hard um, to be successful. And if you look at the numbers of, um, organizing campaigns, usually it's it's not at all unusual to have to go in and run an organizing campaign repeated times over the course of several years before you're successful. And then getting a first contract can be a long drawn out ish, a long drawn out procedure and also um, very difficult. So those are some of the, the pro current problems that the PRO Act is going to try to address. Um, one of the reasons why it's difficult to get a first contract is that although there is a requirement in the statute that you bargain in good faith, you don't necessarily have to, under the law, agree to anything. So you have to bargain in good faith. You have to, if, if you have a union certified and the union and the employer are engaging in collective bargaining, you have to um, have considered the other side's proposal but there's nothing in the law that requires you to agree to any particular proposal. And it's pretty easy as an employer to basically drag your feet and go through the motions and not reach a contract. So that's one of the uh, difficulties in getting a first contract. And of course, if you don't get a first contract, the people who were all excited about being organized get more and more, um, you know, it, it's discouraging. Uh, because you, you aren't able to demonstrate uh, that you have succeeded and you've achieved the goals that you set out by through the organizing campaign. So very briefly, because um, I'm conscious of the time, and uh, there are different, these go, I had the next two slides go through the kinds of things that are unfair labor practices. So the first 8A1 is anything that interferes or coerces employees in the exercise of their Section 7 rights. And remember, I told you Section 7 is really the key right. Um, so this would be, this is a variety of different things. It's threatening employees if they engage in protected concerted activity, threatening employees if they engage in union activity, um, promising benefits to keep employees from engaging in those kinds of activities. Um, Section 8A2 has to do with dominating a union. So this is to make unlawful company 
unions where the company basically ran and controlled the union. And 8A3 is discrimination with regard to um, either any aspect of the job hiring or tenure of employment or conditions to discourage or encourage membership in a labor organization. 8A4 is to protect employees who participate in board procedures. And 8A5 is refusing to bargain collectively with representatives of uh, the, employee, the employer's employees. Um, and then there are similar charges that are, that are conduct that would be unlawful by the union. And then also certain kinds of secondary activity, boycotts. Um, so in other words, one of the powerful, you know, putting pressure on the customer who is not involved in the uh, labor dispute in order to get them to pressure the employer that is involved in the labor dispute is unlawful. And uh, there are certain restrictions on picketing for recognition. recognition. So those kind, all those unfair labor practices are um, things that charges can be filed and can be litigated through the administrative law judge uh, hearing level and then decided by the board. Um, if, there, if either side is not satisfied with the end result of the unfair labor, the administrative law judge hearing. Um, so protecting the right to organize act, which is referred to as the PRO Act, um, actually has already passed the House in March of 2021. Uh, the problem, it's pending before the Senate. Parts of it are incorporated in the Build Back Better legislation. Uh, that, that address is pri primarily trying to um, improve the remedies and enhance the penalties. Um, and uh, as I said to you, there's just really a disconnect between how many people would like to be protected by a union and those who are actually covered by representation and covered by a collective bargaining agreement. So labor law is in the US is broken. Um, and the PRO Act is an attempt to remedy that. Of course, we have the problem with the filibuster and having to reach 60 votes in a 50-50 Senate is very difficult at this point. Um, next slide, which is why as uh, the PRO Act addresses a lot of the things that I alluded to very quickly. Um, so it addresses, it expands the remedies in cases of discrimination and retaliation to make them more like what you have in other areas of federal law where there are violations and penalties. So it includes enhancing the penalties so that it's not just a make whole, but it's actually a, pen a monetary penalty. Because right now the situation is an employer, it's just basically an economic calculation, like the worst case scenario somewhere down the road, we're gonna have to pay back pay. Um, but the enhanced penalties would be a $50,000 penalty. And in cases of, multi, of people who had, who had previously violated the law, even a $100,000 penalty for every violation. Um, trying to address, there's been a lot of back and forth in labor law about a joint employer standard and whether it has to be, um, a joint employer has to actually exercise the authority or just have the potential authority to impact the employees. Um, there's also been problems with a very expansive definition of who's a super supervisor and thus excluded from the protection of the act. So the PRO Act narrows that definition. The PRO Act would provide faster elections because it's been demonstrated that the longer it takes to get to an election during an organizing campaign, employers can conduct captive audience speeches, which is speeches that employees are required to attend where they beat up on and, uh, the employees and basically tell them how horrible unions are and how bad it would be for them to have a union. Whereas the union doesn't have the same opportunity to present their side to the employees in a captive audience speech. So, the PRO Act would prohibit captive audience speeches. Um, it also would ban the right to work laws in states, which Jay alluded to. It also would repeal certain restrictions on secondary and recognitional picketing. And, and this is what would address the first contract act is it creates a mandatory interest arbitration 
to settle first contracts so that even if the parties didn't reach an agreement, it would then be um, mandatory arbitration where the options would be presented to the arbitrator and the arbitrator could impose a first contract. It also prohibits class action waivers in arbitration agreements. Um, next slide. And uh, so these are the provisions of the PRO Act that are excluded in Build Back Better. And as you, I'm sure you know, Build Back Better is a, a bill that is uh, limited. It, it would pass by a, a mere majority, 51 votes, um, rather than having to have the 60 votes. Because it is, uh, if this is, and, and so the only parts of the PRO Act that are not like changing the law, but are simply uh, budget concerns and therefore would appropriately be considered under a, a majority vote as opposed to a, a filibuster situation and needing the 60 votes would be these provisions that have to do with increasing the penalties. Um, and the other aspect of it, which is also in the PRO Act that I didn't list but is important, is it could also provide civil fines um, to per make personally liable liable company officers, directors who had committed a violation in certain circumstances. Again, putting more teeth and more impact into the, uh, the statute. Um, so next slide. And um, I just want to, I'm gonna turn this over to Alberto, but the new general counsel who was put in place by President Biden Jennifer Abruzzo has announced a number of areas where she's trying to, even if the PRO Act doesn't pass, trying to enhance enforcement of the current law, um, even without amendments. And so I will turn it over. And I saw that there were some questions and we'll address those in the questions, but I wanna make sure everyone else has time to talk. So I'll turn it over to our law fellow at the AFL-CIO this year, Alberto Aguera. Great, thanks, Yona. No, I, I actually never really looked at the PRO Act. That's, that's incredible. Looking at all these, uh, what I'm going to discuss is basically trying to work around uh, what the PRO Act would just, would just do. <laughs> it's great. Okay, anyways, uh, so let's get started. Um, hey, everyone, my name is Alberto Aguirre. I'm the current legal fellow at AFL-CIO. It's an honor to be able to present on this topic, especially to an audience from my home state. Um, I grew up in El Paso. I went to UTEP, so go Miners. I hope I, I don't know if there are any UTEP Miner alum here, but that'd be great. Uh, feel free to reach out to me after the presentation, even if it's just to tell me how good your Whataburger was. Uh, I really do miss it. Um, anyways, let's get started. So uh, I figured we can get started with the Wagner Act. Uh, so between 1935 and 1947, uh, before the Taft-Hartley amendments, the NLRB was free to certify unions without holding elections. Now, the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947 repealed that provision that allowed both the board to certify a union by means other than an election. So that means that they had to do an election to be certified. So, however, while a union may only be certified by election, a union could still be designated as an exclusive representative by a majority of employees. This designation can be determined in many ways. Like, for example, uh, a card check, which is uh, in, it, where a majority of workers sign cards indicating that they support the union. Um, the majority of workers can just pick up and strike. Or, or in this really fun and interesting way that they can, uh, they can even um, get majority status by learning from that majority status from an objective and neutral party, like a priest independently confirming that the union possessed the majority, which is a funny, fun little, fun little way to determine a designated exclusive representative. So anyways, uh, section 8A5, uh, under the Joy Silk, the board would find a violation of Section 8A5 of the NLRA when an employer refuses to recognize and bargain with a union that has been designated, remember designated, as a re representative by a majority of employees in an appropriate bargaining unit. Thusly, an employer could be ordered to bargain as a remedy for violating Section 8A5 if it was presented with a designated union's request to bargain and the employer lacked a good faith doubt as to the union's majority status if and when it refused to recognize the union. So, uh, so getting an order to bargain is a powerful tool because during the process of an election, like Yona intimated earlier, uh, employers have been given a vast array of tools to tip the balance of an election to the point when at times it can be doubted that an election is truly, truly represents the majority's will. In all honesty, like seriously, <laughs> before an employer has had a chance to weigh in, um, it's actually a probably much more accurate weighing of employee sentiment before an actual election. Um, now we'll return to how and why this is important later on in the discussion. Um, 
but uh, just keep that in mind that this is a really important tool. Now, uh, the required piece here to get a, a, under the Joy Silk Doctrine is that, um, and the one that ultimately ended up sinking the ship, the Joy Silk ship, is uh, determining whether the employer lacked a good faith doubt at the time the designated union requested to bargain with the employer. So this good faith doubt, right? So um, in the uh, Joy Silk era, a good faith doubt could be shown by a verbalization that the, that it didn't uh, that, that it didn't uh, that it doubted the union's majority designation, or by later committing a ULP, unfair labor practice. So uh, this commission of a ULP was interpreted to indicate that the employer never really doubted the union's designation and actually just represented themselves as doubting it to buy time to undermine the union. So to, so to recap, an employer could be determined to lack a good faith doubt and thus be compelled to bargain with the union bypassing an election if they either admit it, which you know they don't really do, but sometimes they do, or they commit a ULP. And the current state is that the ULP commission during elections are rampant and they've only gotten worse. So there's a, and there's also strong evidence to suggest that these ULPs have an effect on the election process. Uh, basically, employers get to violate the law, hoping that they won't be forced to have a union. And the Joyce of Doctrine uh, uh, can be used to serve as an effective deterrence. This is why it's really important. So um, as I said, this good faith thicket, as described by the board in the later case, sunk the Joyce Silk ship. And it was abandoned by the board in front of the Supreme Court and LRB v. Gissel. Uh, in its place was this extraordinary relief called a GISL order. And uh, the NLRB will only order a GISL bargaining order with, uh, with an uncertified union if the NLRB general counsel proved that the employer committed ULPs that have made the conduct of a fair election unlikely or impossible, even if the NLRB attempts to use its traditional remedies uh, to fix the situation. Meaning anything other than a bargaining order would not mend the election process. This is how bad it would have to be. It's like this really high burden to prove. Um, and because of that burden, Gissel orders are hardly ever issued. It's very rare. Uh, and, this, and this also means that no longer would the NLRB inquire about the employer's good faith or lack thereof for refusing to recognize a union who offered it evidence of majority support. So um, next slide, please. Uh, yep. <laughs> so um, so General, uh, General Counsel Bruzel's first GC memo identified, among many other doctrinal uh, priorities, a reevaluation of Joy Silk. And as I said earlier, the ability to compel an employer um, that knows that the union already has a majority status, but refuses to bargain in hopes that they can tip the scale back on their side is a powerful deter a deterrence in the commission of ULPs. And absent this remedy, uh, ULPs during elections have skyrocketed. Um, for example, illegal discharge ULPs increased by 125% from 8,122 to 18,313 between um, the year uh, 1969, when Joyce was abandoned, to 1981, and it's also and uh, also illegal intimidation charges increased by over 525% from 947 to 6,493. So, uh, by contrast, after rising steadily through the 1960s, the number of conclusive elections have flattened to virtually no growth following the abandonment of Joyce Silk, which can indicate uh, that the lack of deterrence is causing sudden, the sudden stalling in unions winning elections. Uh, yep. So. Uh, as uh, Brian Petruska notes in his law review article titled Adding Joy Silk to Labor's Reform Agenda, uh, he argues that Joy Silk was never uh, decided before the Supreme Court, merely shelled away, and that the board may readopt the doctrine at its discretion. Uh, so that's the Joy Silk uh, doctrine in, in a nutshell, and a powerful, much needed tool, but not without its doctrinal flaws. Uh, but there, but uh, as I will explain later on, it is, it is um, part of the priorities for the general counsel's office, and it will definitely be wrestled in the, in the near future. So um, that's Joy Silk. Let's move on to the next. Great, thank you. So, all right. So um, this is about the uh, what type of remedies can it can can uh, can employees get, right? So um, the NLRA uh, Section 10C empowers the board to take such affirmative action as will effectuate the policies of this act. Now, this language gives the board a broad and flexible array of remedial powers to use at their discretion. That sweeping power has been upheld by Supreme Court multiple times. And uh, so the policies or objectives of the act include preventing unlawful conduct like unfair labor practices and to make employees whole from said violations. Make whole remedies are an essential part of the board's remedial powers. When it comes to make whole remedies, uh, achieving status quo ante is the objective. And I think that's really important. Uh, because that will be the use uh, used as a justification for the um, the board's uh, the GC's 
uh, policy to expand those remedies. So, uh, in other words, a board should, uh, in other words, a, a board order should be calculated to restore the situation as nearly as possible to that which would have occurred but for the legal discrimination. The logic in that is that making discriminatories whole by remedying such harms effectuates the policies of the act by restoring the status quo ante so that employees can engage in the practice and procedure of collective bargaining without fear of reprisal. So that's the logic in, in that. Uh, and another note on the flexibility of the board's remedial scope, the, board's, uh, the board can consider both the specific circumstances of the case and at large employee employee dynamics. That really demonstrates how broad uh, that scope, the remedial scope is um, for the board. Um, yeah, next, next slide, please. Great. So, um, but there are, there are some limits to the remedial, the board's remedial power. Uh, the Supreme Court has limited affirmative action to include remedial damages, but not punitive damages. And this is why the uh, PRO Act was really interesting to me, uh, because it, it would it would basically allow for fines. And in and, its current state, you, you can't find, you can only make whole, an employee make whole, right? Um, and uh, this is where opinions may differ. Um, but uh, some argue that there are some further constraints, like limiting damages to non-tortious conduct that could be better suited in state court. Uh, this limit is one that has been directly discussed in three um, which I'll discuss three, but that's basically the the uh, the case that the that the general counsel's office is using to introduce this this uh, expense in uh, in uh, make whole remedies. And uh, I have here the types of remedies uh, have, that already um, that have already been awarded in the past from employer unfair labor practices, and they include things like reinstatement, back pay, reimbursement for economic losses. Let's let's shelve that because that is that that's what's at issue. Um, economic uh, income tax penalty, ruined clothing, damaged toolboxes, and metal expenses. So everything that that stems from a ULP, these are the type of damages that come out of them. Next slide, please. Yeah. So um, yeah, so the NLRB invited briefs regarding consequential damages in three. And um, so, and consequential damages are part of the general counsel's broader goals to expand its traditional make whole remedy to more fully account for their actual economic losses. Um, and uh, there are several questions were asked in that, in that, in that brief. They, uh, two of them include, um, should the board modify traditional make whole remedy in all pending and future cases to include relief for consequential damages? where these damages are direct and foreseeable results of a respondent's unfair labor practice. And um, so what, like, what is consequential damages? This would look like an employer being required to pay a late fee penalty for an employee missing the payment on a car because the employee was unlawfully discharged, right? So it's not necessarily, not just the money lost, but the fee associated with not having the money and then not being able to pay a, a, a car payment and then getting that fee. The employer would be on the hook for that too. So it's a little bit of broadening and, and returning to the status quo ante of the employee. And that's all within, you know, arguably within the remedial scope of the NLRB. And uh, the second question is, if consequential damages are to be included in a make whole remedy relief, how should they be proved and what should be required to demonstrate that they are a direct and foreseeable result of an unfair labor practice? So we see here uh, that we have that general counsel Bruzo is attempting to bring enforcement of the act back up, right? We see that the that labor law is incredibly weak. And um, one way she is doing that is by exploring how the traditional make whole remedy can be expanded to it can be expanded to better achieve status quo ante. Uh, and that's those are basically the two really interesting doctrinal shifts that are happening with the board. There's a lot of really good, good, interesting stuff. And I encourage people to, to look them up. Uh, yeah, that's it for me. Thanks. Well, thank you for the invitation. I'm Linda Morales, and I'm with the Gulf Coast Area Labor Federation as well. I've been an organizer well over 20 plus years. Um, I wanted to share some of my experiences as an organizer, specifically why workers want a union and what workers face when they choose a union. First, why do workers want the union? Well, the reasons are are different, you know, for each uh, for all workers. Here's some places that I've been part of organizing efforts and why those workers chose to form a union. Uh, the photo on the screen is when I worked for National Nurses Organizing Committee in NU, California Nurses Association. Uh, we organized only registered nurses. Uh, in case of registered nurses, nurses want to be able to provide safe patient care. They advocated for safe nurse to patient ratios and having a say in the delivery of care to their, to their patients. That was critically important to them. Uh, you may not know, have known, but at one point we had five union hospitals in Texas. 
three are still uh, union in Texas, two in El Paso, one in uh, Brownsville. Uh, the, this organizing drive with nurses began as a result of an agreement that California Nurses Association had with Tenant Hospital. Many of our California Tenant Hospitals were union at that time, and that leverage helped the CNA come up with an agreement with a hospital here in Texas that basically said, one, none of us shall speak bad of each other, two, tenant will allow union organizers in their facilities, and three, tenant will allow the nurses to choose union if they want if they want to. But by the time we hit the nursing unions, uh, the nursing units, excuse me, the antis were ready for us. Um, but the nurses prevailed um, back in 2007. Um, at that time, uh, the only union, Houston Union Hospital was SciFair Hospital, which is now no longer a tenant facility and no longer union. Another organizing drive that happened in Houston, uh, Mitsubishi Caterpillar forklift drivers organized for better working conditions and safe environment. That bargaining unit was all male, uh, very, very diverse, Latinos, Vietnamese, Nigerians, Ethiopians, Jamaicans, Bosnians, Russians, and African-Americans. Workers won their election uh, by a, a close margin, but the company came, uh, came to the bargaining table, bargained in good faith, then filed a desert election, end of campaign. Uh, another campaign uh, that I was involved in uh, was workers who manufactured air conditioning ducts. The workforce was 75, 75 Latinos and 120 Vietnamese workers. I'll preface this campaign with, with that the Latino workforce staged a wildcat strike. They walked off their jobs on their own. Uh, one of our folks saw them picketing out of the plant and alerted our local Central Labor Council. I happened to be in Puerto Rico organizing at that time. I was called back to Houston. Uh, it was a huge task but our to get them their jobs back. But our Democratic leadership at that time, Jackson Lee, Mario Gallegos, and others, met with the workers, put pressure on the company. Workers told their story to them on the local level, on the national media level. They got their jobs back. Uh, they wanted a union because the Latino workforce was tired of being segregated from the Vietnamese. Uh, each uh, ethnicity worked in different areas of the plant, assigning the Latino workers more dangerous work, exposure to fiberglass dust, and only the Latino workers were assigned to clean the kitchen. So those workers uh, organized for dignity and respect, and they also wanted an hourly wage like the Vietnamese workers, whereas the Latino workers were working by piecemeal work. Uh, we lost the election, we knew we would. Uh, workers <clears throat> filed discrimination charges with EEOC and won. So it was a victory of a different kind. Uh, the moral of the story that is that if you want a union, stay on your job. And I think many of you may remember the J4J for J, uh, organizing drive here in Houston where janitors organized for healthcare coverage and for a pay raise. Uh, they hadn't had a pay raise in many years, no access to healthcare, largely a Latina workforce, many actions, uh, civil disobedience to bring attention to the issues these workers were facing. Finally, 5,000 janitors won their campaign for healthcare and pay raise and a pay raise. So some of the common tactics that companies use to dissuade workers from joining a union, I think all of us that have been involved in union organizing campaigns could write a book, but it's threats, it's interrogation, it's promises, it's surveillance, uh, captive audience meetings, consistent, uh, consistent of daily doses of anti-union videos and presentations, you know, me, to me, taking the ER and ICU registered nurses away from their patients to attend these meetings uh, was unconscionable. Uh, now these uh, un sophisticated union busters have union burst busters of all ethnic ethnicities to relate to the workforce and their material is in literature of all languages. These captive uh, audience meetings, you know, these daily doses of anti-union messages have a huge impact because the laws are stacked against workers. You may st start off a union organizing drive with 70% of your workforce signing cards to be represented by the union, but as the anti-union campaign progresses, that percentage drops and drops. So we need a level playing field here, and I believe the PRO Act gives workers that protection. In closing, uh, uh, you could put up that slide, Jay. I wanna uh, share a quote from one of my favorite union leaders, Dolores Huerta with the United Farm Workers. If we don't have workers organized into labor unions, we're in great peril of losing our democracy. It's up to all of us folks. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Linda. Thank you, all the speakers. Actually, can I can I give you a, a quick question, Linda? Whoop, there you go. Uh, particularly now, I mean, one of the things you, you realize when you try cases, is you want to make sure that that what's it matter to me when you're talking to jurors, but for this audience and others, what would be the importance, particularly in dealing with all they're facing with COVID and its consequences, what would be the importance to everybody in the community of organized union nurses? Well, I, I'm not quite clear. What's on the question. benefit of having a union when you're talking about a nurses in a hospital and the oh, safety of patients and what needs nurse, to happen? Nurse, nurses have a say in what's going to happen. Uh, and, you know, nurses are the ones who deliver, they're the frontline folks to deliver a safe patient care. And it's those nurses who determine the better, the, 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 the better care for their patients. So it's important that they have a say in the care of their patients. And how does a union help that? I'm, I'm giving you softball number two, but go ahead. How does a union help them? Well, they organize when they're at the bargaining table, they organize for some of the things that they want. And I know that in the case of of registered nurses, they wanted safe staff to patient ratios because what happens, there aren't enough nurses and we're seeing a, a, you know, the shortage of nurses right now. So even when there wasn't COVID, there still was a shortage of nurses because we were losing nurses because of some of the demands that some of the hospitals were making of them. So it helps having a say on the job for better patient care. Uh, and since you're up, and actually, Alberto, we do have a, another minor on here, by the way, so your, your shout out worked. Uh, uh, in terms of kind of... A, uh, Mike, I think we have another speaker, too, so I don't want to... Yep, I, I apologize. Go ahead. I, I, I jumped in. Sorry. Please go ahead. Hey, John. Uh, hi, my name's John Lowe. I'm the Secretary Treasurer for uh, Local 51. I, we're really low on time, so if you'll go to the next one for me, Jay. The biggest challenge that we have always faced in the entertainment industry is this fear of, of change, um, this fear of disrupting the status quo. Um, some of the people we organize are not super high paid. Um, in the entertainment industry, you hear about people making millions and millions of dollars, but the, the, the women that change the hair and the makeup and uh, the workers that clean up when everybody's left are closer down in the 15, you know, 15, 20 dollar an hour range. And um, they're really worried about what's going to happen next. Their management says, you know, oh, if we go union, you're not going to, you're going to lose your job or we're not going to be able to have all five of you here. We're going to have to cut down to three. Um, so that's a really hard one for us to overcome. Uh, and if you'll do the next slide, kind of our ongoing challenge with Dr. Strange is we as the entertainment industry, we have a really hard time finding out who we actually work for. Um, most of you have probably seen or heard of Dr. Strange, the big movie, uh, the Marvel movie. Uh, producers, the two producers, uh, main producers, sorry, he's only one guy. They don't work for him. Uh, Marvel Studios. Most people don't work for them either. Um, nobody really works for Disney. They work for more of a local production company or a regional sub DBA of Walt Disney, or perhaps they just work for Doctor Strange Inc. because they'll they'll form an independent company just for that one production. So as a as an organizer, um, in the big Hollywood movies, we can figure it out, but that's the ongoing problem for, for a big festival you see in the city where you're at or for movies or a TV show or commercial work that we do like convention work and um, things. We have a really hard time sometimes trying to figure out who is the actual employer when we're trying to organize them. Um, and then one other problem that we run into in Texas uh, that we were ho hoping will be fixed, but there's a law that says you can't, the um, government entities can't have contracts, can't have collective bargaining agreements with unions. So in other states, they'll organize the venue. They'll organize, uh, in Houston, they would organize the Wortham Center um, or the Jones Hall, but Jones Hall is owned by the city. 
So I can't organize it. So we have to organize all the producers that come in. Um, in New York, they'll organize uh, uh, the garden. Uh, so anybody that comes in is underneath that collective bargaining agreement. Um, I know we're running really low on time, so uh, that's about all I have to say. So. And John, I do apologize, but I, I, we've got a question for you, and that is, how do you fix that? In other words, is that something legislative? Is there a way to make a city ordinance to allow organization of a venue, or what would be um, able to fix that? In this state, it would be state law. Um, it comes down from Austin at the moment. Um, Jay probably has a better understanding of the process, but those are all that's all state law i don't know if the pro act would change it it might um with the prohibition of right to work um so you know, can you can you weigh in on that a little bit um i think you know the it, the pro act would change it a little bit not it wouldn't solve your pro, the problem that john is really talking about it changes it just in terms of it might give you a joint employer argument because you might have um, a non-public entity. I mean, and Texas is, a, is, I mean, we have to change Texas really because, you know, as uh, Jay said in the beginning, the pr uh, public employees in Texas have no right to bargain unless you're in a li very limited police and firefighter situations. Um, and I always used to say when I was in Texas, you know, the only right, one, an earlier AG, not your current AG, gave to public employees was the right to collectively beg, but not any right to collectively bargain. So um, so I think that I, the, the PRO Act does not, I mean, we have to change Texas and we have to change state law. So because other states have rights where state employees do have rights to collectively bargain. And that's what we need to move towards in Texas. Well, thank you. Thank you all. And, 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 you know, I think probably from our perspective, there's so much here that we probably should have figured out a way to, to, to divide this into two and, and not only the background and history that you all shared with us, but also, you know, steps to take change. And I think that's something maybe for our June event uh, that we actually, uh, one or more of y'all can join us at the Hotel Zaza in the third week of June, because this is one of those things that if you talk about what really makes a difference for working families and what can make a difference for what the Democratic Party is looking for, exactly what you're talking about is one of the most important building blocks. So thank you all for joining us. Thank you for being so organized. Uh, I want to leave our audience with three things. One is uh, February 10th, there's going to be a noon CLE uh, at South Texas College of Law and virtual creative luring with Chris Feldman. And then on Texas Independence Day, this will be on Wednesday, March 2nd, Texas Independence Day, we're going to have Rice Professor, longtime environmental activist lawyer, Jim Blackburn, uh, talking about his book, The Earth Church. And it really is, it's, it's going to be a, an ethics hour because in large part, it's talking about the journey of a busy trial lawyer and how he built not just his practice, not just his crusade for the environment, but also worked on himself in a correct way. And thanks to longtime HCLA board member, we're also going to have an opportunity at the get-go to hear from Nicholas Kristoff, the New York Times Pulitzer Prize winner, who's Democratic candidate for governor in Oregon. Thank you all very much for being here. Uh, it's at recorded. It'll be on our Facebook within 24 to 48 hours. Thank you, Harold Mullins. And we look forward to seeing y'all in person shortly and certainly virtually in the next two months. Thank you. <laughs>